All I'm offering is the truth, nothing more. I'd like to talk to you this morning about something in which I believe very deeply. As a matter of fact, I think I can say that I never did say anything from the pulpit that I didn't believe fully. If a preacher doesn't believe what he says, there's a phony element in it. So he can always count on this pulpit saying what it believes. And usually, I hope, with logic. And what I want to talk to you about this morning is something about which I have very deep convictions. And it is this. You can actually believe yourself to achievement. You can actually believe yourself to happiness. You can believe yourself to health and well-being if there's a catch to it if you really believe not some vague kind of an intellectual ass ant but if you with all your heart believe if you believe with an intensity of belief, then you can believe yourself to every good thing. And unhappily, by the same process, you can believe yourself to sickness, you can believe yourself to failure, you can believe yourself to unhappiness, you can believe yourself to any old bad thing. If your intensity of belief is in that direction, well, you say, how do you know about all this? Because of the Bible, which I believe completely. I've never, over all the years of my life, known this Bible to tell me anything that wasn't a fact. Never. And in addition to that, I've seen what I've said work out so many times in personal experience that I haven't any doubt about it. Now, the Bible says some very astonishing, in seemingly incredible things. Amazing book. It says, it says, if you have faith, even as a little grain of mustard seed, that's not much, but what it is, there is of it is real, intense. If you have faith even as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say to that great, big, looming, overwhelming, forbidding mountain, be removed and be ye cast into the sea out of sight. And do not doubt in your heart and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Now that is really something. Now that doesn't mean that you say to Mount Everest, get out of my way. <laughs> That'd be foolish. It wouldn't do it. But you got some big old worry, haven't you? You got some big old discouragement. You got some big old 
failure out there. And you say to it, away with you in the name of the Lord. I know that sounds pretty comprehensive. But the Bible goes on to say, that which is impossible with men is possible with God. That is to say, what you can't do yourself when you have a deep faith in and fellowship with God, you can handle anything. I didn't make this up. And I'm not overemphasizing it. I'm plainly stating the facts as are written in the Bible. But, you know, the people who wrote the Bible knew human nature. And again, it said in the scripture lesson which was read this morning, which was all about faith, according to your faith, it shall be done unto you. So if you say to me, none of those big old great things ever happened to me, the answer could very well be in all kindness, you haven't got that much faith. Because what happens to you is going to be measured precisely by what faith you've got. So if you've got a little puny, infantile, and fragile faith, but sometimes even the Lord, out of his great kindness, does something for people like that. But if you have a great, big, robust faith, then I want to tell you, I want to tell you, tremendous things can happen to human beings. For example, take ordinary life situations when it seems like you're completely at a dead end and you're licked and you're defeated. Now we have a magazine called Guidepost. I hope you read Guidepost. If you don't, you don't really belong among the intellectuals of this country. But, but, but it's not a, a big old intellectual magazine. It's a simple magazine of faith, but it's got three and a half million subscribers and is read by 12 million people in this country every, every uh, month. And I could name some of the most noted magazines, and it's bigger than they are. Number 14 among all the magazines of the United States. Well, we had a story in there about a man named Valeriano Silva. Now, Valeriano is a mechanic, an automobile mechanic, and a good one. And believe me, a good automobile mechanic is worth his weight in gold. Because when you take a car into him, it comes out okay. Not the uh, kind you drive around the block and find that it's falling apart. Well, Valerio was driving a car back to his garage one day when all of a sudden everything went black in front of him. He eased the car to the shoulder as he'd seen the road a moment before. He was only two blocks from home, and in total darkness, he felt his way home. And went in the house and he said to his wife, Sophia, honey, what's wrong with me? I can't see anything. Oh, she said, it's probably a temporary situation. I'll call a doctor. The doctor took him to a big hospital in San Antonio. They lived in South Texas. And they examined him and told him he was completely blind. So he went back home and sat on the porch. A mechanic 
sensitive, skillful fingers. But he had to be able to see. Though he remembered in this moment that somebody had once said to him, Valerio, uh, you could fix a car with your eyes closed. And that thought activated his mind. Then he remembered what his father had said to him as a boy when he would get angry and in a rage. His father would say, son, breathe out your anger by breathing in God. Curious uh, advice. But he said he'd followed it all his life. So now he was in utter depression. Complete discouragement. So he remembered the advice. And he breathed out the discouragement and breathed in God. He breathed out his sense of failure and breathed in God. He breathed out his feelings of futility and breathed in God. And he got so full of God that he called his wife and he said, Sophia, I'm still a good mechanic. I still know everything there is to know about an automobile. I still know where to go with my fingers into an automobile. Take me back to the garage, honey. So she took his hand and she led him into the garage where she, sweet soul, had been trying to do his work. And she said, uh, this car was brought in last night, and none of us can seem to fix it. It was a Dodge. And this is no reflection on the Dodge car. <laughs> he ran his hands over the car Ah, doesn't that feel beautiful? Even the garage had the same smells of oil and grease and gasoline and grit. A lovely smell, he said. He was back home now. And he went back to the rear end of the car and he said, start the car. And she started it. And he reached down and he took hold of the exhaust pipe and he felt the air that was coming from the exhaust pipe in peculiar convulsions and jerks. And he said, why, anybody would know what this is. It's a bad valve. So he reached back to the front end of the car and lifted the front end and went into the engine with joy welling in his heart. And he fixed the valve. He could tell by the warmth in the headlights what the condition of the battery was. Now, in that town, they don't speak of the blind mechanic. They speak of that good mechanic who breathed out failure and hopelessness and breathe in God. According to your faith, it shall be done unto you. But you know, there are a lot of negative thinkers in this world, and I run into them occasionally. We don't have any here in this church except if they may come in here from Philadelphia or, or, or Boston or somewhere. But I was with two good friends of mine the other night in Chicago. I've known them a long while. Uh, the, the husband is a college professor, and the wife is a lovely lady who runs a beautiful home, active in the community. 
and they were taking me back down from their house to the hotel. And on the way down, the uh, the, uh, husband was venting many negative opinions, how the city of Chicago was going to the dogs, and how even though the Republicans were riding high, wide, and handsome at the moment, they would flop like the rest of them. And uh, his opinions on everything were, you know, about as bad as you could get it. And I started to say to him, Jack, the trouble with you is you're a negative thinker. Now he said, don't give me any of that positive thinking stuff. He said, I go to a church in Chicago where we've got an intellectual minister. And I said, the inference is what? (laughs) Yeah, he said, he doesn't hand out any of that positive thinking stuff. I said, how's the church getting along? He said, well, we're in a bad way. He said to me, do you think this positive thinking business really works? This idea of faith, I I said, of course I do. And just then, we went by the Armour Institute on Michigan Avenue, beautiful building. I said, you know what that place is over there, Jack? He said, yeah, that's the Armour Institute. Name for whom, I said. He said, one of the Armour Packing Company. Oh, yeah, I said, I can tell you how that place got there. I said, there used to be a preacher in this city of Chicago by the name of Frederick W. Gonsalus, G-U-N-S-A-U-L-U-S, I guess it must have been spelled. He went to the same college I did, the old years before. Forty years before. <laughs> But I heard him once when I was a small young boy. I was a freshman in college. I can see him yet. He was an orator of the old school. The kind of Bill Canfield uh, develops, a professor of speaking who sits over here at my left every Sunday. Imagine having a professor of public speaking sitting at your left every Sunday. (laughs) But he's so kind-hearted, he, he, he ignores your deficiencies and <laughs> comes up with it. But anyway, Gonzalez was a, an orator. Powerful. I can see he was tall, he was athletic, he had a leonine head, and he would stride across the pulpit and strike gestures and hold them for five minutes, seemed like. Everybody was breathless until his hand would drop and then they'd all come to. But Gonzalez got interested in young people and he got some ideas. All he needed was money. So he said to himself, where can I get some money? So he said, what is money? Money is only the symbol of wealth. Green. There's some of it right here. But wealth belongs to God. And God has money. So therefore, he says, I'll ask God for some money. So he sat down and he figured out how much he needed. A million dollars. Now, this was about 40, 50 years ago, maybe, when a million dollars would be uh, worth about four million dollars right now. But he won a million dollars. So he announced on a Sunday in the newspaper that he was going to preach on a sermon, preach a sermon on the topic, what I will do with a million dollars. Not what I would do if I had a million dollars, but what I will do with a million dollars. And the church was packed the next Sunday. So he delivered one of his most memorable sermons on what I will do 
with that million dollars, what he was going to do with the young people of Chicago. He wasn't going to use it to build a bigger building. He didn't want any bigger building. He wanted bigger people. So he had finished the sermon and he had announced to him when a man got up about three quarters of the way back, walked up the aisle, walked up the pulpit, walked over beside Dr. Gonzalez and said, I'd like to say something to you. He said, tell the people to stop singing the hymn. <laughs> and he said, Dr. Gonzalez, something grabs me. Something tells me you are, you have a great and a wonderful idea. Something has impressed itself upon me. If you will come to my office tomorrow morning at nine o'clock, I will arrange for you to have your million dollars. The man's name was Philip Armour of the packing company. And the building on Michigan Avenue is the result of the million dollars. You know, I'm thinking right now, what would I do if I had a million dollars? <laughs> this gives me a wonderful idea. <laughs> Gonzalez said later that he had such an immersion in intense faith that he wasn't at all surprised when this wonderful thing happened. Now you are a believer. I doubt if I have one unbeliever in the church. You always may have one or two, but they're not 100% unbelievers or they wouldn't be hanging around. But the question is, how much of a believer are you? Now you're going to leave this church in a few moments and you're going back home and you're going to find the same problem you left there this morning. Or tomorrow morning when you get to your office you'll find the same problem. Now I don't know how you left it. I'm interested in how you go back to it. You go back to it with intense faith like like this a friend of mine died the other day his name was Orville Kelly and I saw his wife Wanda yesterday and I hold in my hand a call back telephone paper there in every office and it reads as follows. It's signed by her little son, Britt, age 10. Ms. Kelly, time 9.51. While you were out, God called from heaven. Phone number unlisted. He said, your husband is doing very well up there in heaven. He is happy and wants you to know that when your work is done on earth, you will be together again forever. What would you think would be the emotions of a mother had a message from God to her 10-year-old son. Well, the main thing about it all is that this boy has intense faith at age 10. If he holds it, he's in for life. 
Our Heavenly Father, we've been talking to these wonderful people about faith in you. And everything we've said is the truth. Because you're the truth, you love us all, you told us to believe in you, and according to our faith, it will be done unto us. So bless all these wonderful people with your divine grace. Amen.